Good afternoon, friends. My name is Jeff Kasman. Welcome to Tradition. Um, my partner, Jim DePiante, has joined me yet again for another episode where we answer questions and talk about the things that are important to people who are new to tradition. Whether you just started going to the traditional Latin mass or you've been coming for many years and you've always wondered, well, why does the priest do that? Or why do we do this? Or perhaps you've seen different things in different places and you wanna know what the right thing is to do at the, at the right time and the right manner in which to do it. And uh, so that's what we're talking about. Jim, welcome uh, once again. Thank you, Jeff. Glad to be here. Hello, everyone. Now, in our uh, our first few episodes, uh, I, I want to just briefly recap because we continue to get questions that we've already answered, and I want to direct you all to to the right episodes. In the first few episodes of this series, Welcome to Tradition, we talked about the basic principles for gestures and postures at Mass. We talked about how and when it's appropriate to make those gestures. And we did a kind of a deep dive into the different levels of the solemnity of the masses that you're likely to see. Uh, we talked about fasting and abstinence, and we talked about what you should do and when you should do it at a sung mass uh, versus what might be different at a low mass in terms of the, the gestures and postures of the faithful. Now, on this episode, we're going to look at the particular liturgical season that we find ourselves in. Happy Easter, everyone. Uh, and we're going to put that in the overall context of the liturgical year because the church has given us this wonderful gift uh, to live by the liturgical year and talk about some of the things that differ between the different uh, seasons. So, uh, Jim, I'm going to uh, send it over to you. Can you start with an overview of the liturgical calendar to give us a context for the season that we're in right now? Certainly. So, the liturgy is about the rhythms of our lives. And those rhythms include the hours of the day, the days of the week, the weeks, the months. And finally, the overarching rhythm of the liturgy is the year. So we're in, uh, we're in Easter right now, but there's more than one way for us to kind of reckon a, a year, right? We've got Gregorian and Julian calendars and the church's calendars. So give us some perspective, please. Okay. So in the Latin church in particular, according to the Gregorian calendar, the year we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis has, it's the 12 months, 365 days, strictly the solar year. It's our calendar year. And that's what we work with routinely. But there's also the lunar year, and that's based on the cycles of the moon. Now, for Americans, most of our audience, but certainly most English speakers, we would associate a lunar year with like the Chinese New Year. Why should it be interesting to us as Catholics? Well, to understand that, you have to understand the basis for the liturgical year. Principal dates are established by two events, one reckoned by the solar calendar and the other left reckoned by the lunar calendar. The liturgy celebrates two great mysteries of our faith. The first mystery is the fact of, of God becoming man. The second great mystery is the fact of that God man dying and then rising from the dead. So our liturgical calendar is based on these two great mysteries of our faith. It is, and the liturgical year is thus divided into two great cycles based on those events. The first cycle celebrates the fact of God becoming man. And so it's referred to as the incarnation cycle. The second cycle follows on the first and celebrates the fact of that God man dying and then rising from the dead, the resurrection. This is the Paschal cycle. And as the Paschal cycle concludes, we start back again with the incarnation cycle. Now, where does all this fit in relation to the two ways of determining the year, the solar and the lunar? So the solar calendar is the, the calendar we use in our daily lives. The first cycle, the incarnation cycle, is based on a date that comes directly off the solar calendar. That is, it is based on the date of Christmas. And Christmas is always on December 25th, as reckoned by the solar calendar. How is that date established liturgically? So Christmas, the birth of our Lord, is calculated based on the incarnation. 
Now, the incarnation itself occurred at the Annunciation. When the angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, she conceived of the Holy Ghost. That is celebrated on March 25th. And so with a little bit of mathematics and a little bit of biology, we could say March 25th, add nine months of gestation, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December 25th, nine months after March 25th is the day on which we celebrate the birth of our Lord. So what about the Paschal cycle? I think it's a little more complicated. <laughs> yeah, not, not so simple. So the Paschal cycle is based on a date according to the lunar calendar. That is, it's based on the date of Easter. And Easter is based entirely on the lunar cycle, on the lunar calendar. But the solar and the lunar calendars don't line up the same every year. So how do we establish the solar date for Easter, in the fact that it's being based on the lunar calendar? And <laughs> therein lies the problem. So the lunar calendar begins, the first month of the lunar year begins with the first moon of spring. That month is called Nisan. The full moon occurs on the 14th day of each month, of each lunar month. And so the full moon, the first full moon in the spring occurs on the 14th day of Nisan. And Easter is calculated as the Sunday after the 14th of Nisan. And, and Nisan we're talking about is a, is a Jewish or a Hebrew name. Reference. For Exactly. And so tell me, what's the story behind this? Why, why is it the case that as Catholics, we, we follow kind of this strange old Jewish way of calculating this date? Well, the story is told in the book of Exodus at nightfall at a certain point during the Egyptian captivity. And I'm going to quote scripture directly. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, and then the Lord referred to the new moon. And he said, this moon or this month shall be the first of the year, on the 10th day of this month, let every man take a lamb by their families and houses. And you shall keep this lamb until, take note, the 14th day of this month, and the whole multitude of the children of Israel shall sacrifice it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood thereof and put it upon both the side posts and the upper door posts of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. And I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will kill every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. So the name of that first month is Nisan, and on the 14th day of Nisan, the Israelites slaughtered the Passover lamb. And commemorate the event known as the Pasch every year thereafter. In fact, the Last Supper was precisely the celebration of the Pasch, of the Passover. It took place on a Thursday, the 14th day of Nisan, as the moon was waxing full. The following day, a Friday, the 15th of Nisan, the Lamb of God was slain. And as we know, at midnight between Saturday, the 16th of Nisan, and Sunday, the 17th of Nisan, our Lord rose from the dead the first Easter, which took place immediately after the first full moon of the spring. And by the way, that's why there's always a full moon during Holy Week. As it turns out, the date of Easter can vary by as many as 35 days with respect to the solar calendar. So we have these two great cycles that you've just explained, the incarnation cycle based on December 25th and the Paschal cycle based on the 14th of Nisan, which can vary by as much as five weeks. Tell us more about these two cycles. I know that you've got more to unpack for us. So it's characteristic of the liturgy to prepare for a feast, and typically that involves fasting and, and penitence, then to have the feast, and then to have some time subsequent to the feast to, to really celebrate it and to, to prolong the celebration. What does that look like in the incarnation cycle? So it begins, of course, with a time of preparation. Of course, that's the liturgical season of Advent, more or less four weeks, depending on which day of the week Christmas will fall on that year. Then there's Christmas Day itself. But as we well know, Christmas Day isn't the day. There's the octave of Christmas. So there are eight entire days in which we celebrate Christmas. 
That's followed by Christmas tide, which lasts until the Feast of the Purification, 40 days subsequent to Christmas on February 2nd. Within Christmas tide, we have the Feast of the Epiphany. Then we have Epiphany tide, consisting of some number of sun Sundays after Epiphany, that could be as few as one or as many as six, depending on when the variable Paschal cycle will then begin. So the incarnation cycle begins with the first Sunday of Advent and has within it the following liturgical seasons. First Advent, then Christmas Day, the octave of Christmas, Christmas tide, and within Christmas tide, Epiphany tide. Now Christmas tide ends on February 2nd. Regardless, Epiphany tide can actually end before or subsequent to Christmas tide. So where do the 12 days of Christmas fit into all of this? Well, the, the 12 days are more of a cultural phenomenon than a liturgical season. So the, of the 12 days, the first day is, of course, Christmas, and it encompasses the liturgical octave. It's also important to note that Epiphany is not the 12th day of Christmas. Epiphany tide ends on the 12th night which is January 5th, which is to say the evening before the Epiphany. So Christmas tide and, and the incarnation cycle officially end on February 2nd. Why doesn't that become the start of the Paschal cycle? <laughs> That's the problem with it. It was so simple. We have to keep in mind that the Paschal cycle can vary by as much as five weeks. It's all based on the date of Easter. Naturally, Easter being the greatest of all feasts, we won't be surprised to see there's a period, a long period of preparation for Easter. And of course, that's the liturgical season of Lent, which begins on Ash Wednesday, 46 days before Easter. But not only, the preparation for Easter is so important that there's a period of preparation for the period of preparation. And that's the liturgical season of Septuagesima. That begins three weeks before Lent begins. So the Paschal cycle actually begins nine Sundays before Easter with Septuagesima Sunday. So where does Septuagesima Sunday fall in relation to the end of the incarnation cycle on February 2nd? Well, it depends, like everything else in the Paschal cycle, on the date of Easter. The earliest that Septuagesima Sunday can occur, and it's very rare that it does, is March 22nd. Backing up nine weeks from, I'm sorry, that's the earliest Easter can occur. Back up nine weeks from there, the earliest Septuagesima can occur is January 18th, and that's early indeed. When it comes that early, it actually creates an overlap between the incarnation cycle and the Paschal cycle of two weeks. In that instance, Epiphany tide would last only one Sunday. So you get Epiphany, then the first Sunday after Epiphany, and that is that. The latest Easter can occur is April 25th, in which case Septuagesima would fall on February 22nd. Epiphany tide would then be extended to six weeks. All right, so the church has given us three weeks of preparation for the preparation, Septuagesima prior to Lent, followed by six weeks of preparation for Easter, that's Lent. If the feast uh, of Easter is that great, then obviously there's going to be an octave that will will follow. That it, indeed there is, and we are right in the middle of it as we record this. So what's what's next then in terms of liturgical seasons? Right. Paschal tide continues, and then encompasses the ascension and the nine days of the first novena between ascension and Pentecost and then ends on the Saturday before Trinity Sunday, Trinity Sunday being the first Sunday after Pentecost. Now, in terms of Sundays after Pentecost, there can be as few as 23 and as many as 28. This is an interesting thing to observe. Remember I said that after Epiphany, there can be as few as one Sundays after Epiphany and as many as six. Conversely, after Pentecost, there can be as few as 23 and as many as 28 Sundays. They will always sum to 29. So in a year when we have 23 Sundays after Pentecost, that's as short as it can be, we will have had six Sundays after Epiphany. And I'm, I, you, you can clearly do the arithmetic after that. And, and so obviously this is all driven by when Easter is. That's right. 
So what are, let's cover the liturgical seasons within the Paschal cycle. Sure enough, Septuagesima, Lent. Then we have Easter, the octave of Easter, Paschal tide or Easter tide, Pentecost, and then the time after Pentecost. And so the Paschal cycle goes from Septuagesima Sunday through the last Sunday after Pentecost. And then the first Sunday of Advent in the Incarnation cycle began anew with the seasons of? Advent, Christmas Day, the octave of Christmas, Christmas Tide, within Christmas Tide, Epiphany Tide. Christmas Tide ends on February 2nd, more or, uh, more or less, uh, depending on the following Septuagesima, when the Paschal cycle begins again. Now, as you have said, we're in the heart of the octave of, of Easter right now. So what does that mean in terms of liturgical life? So to understand what's different, let's just look at what's typical, and then we can see how it varies. The first not noticeable difference comes before Mass. Normally at a sung or solemn Mass, that will start with asperges. Asperges me. In the octave and then all through Paschal Tide, instead of the asperges, we sing vidi aquam. Next, normally throughout the year, you'll be hearing typically Mass, not, mass 11 or Mass 4 being sung. In Christmas Tide, you will have heard Mass 2, typically. In Advent and, less, and Lent, typically Mass 17. In Paschal Tide, you should be hearing Mass 1. It's not, it's not um, uh, prescribed, but it's certainly preferred. And uh, for folks who maybe are hearing those, uh, those different mass references, if you have the, uh, the version of the Missal, the Roman Missal from Angelus Press, uh, at the back of that, the very back, you'll see all of those different mass settings. Uh, you might see them in, their, in your chapels uh, listed, you can go to the very last few pages and see the, the different mass uh, settings. And of course, if you have a Liber, you'll be able to find those generally uh, at the very beginning. Uh, okay, so that brings us to, uh, you brought us up to date. There's also something else happening with uh, an Alleluia. Right, welcome back. So normally, after the epistle, you're going to have the gradual and one Alleluia. But because we banish the Alleluia from the liturgy in the Latin church, starting with Septuagesima Sunday and then throughout Lent, rather than the gradual followed by the Alleluia, you have a gradual and a tract and no Alleluia. In Paschal Tide, you don't have a gradual. Instead, you have two Alleluias. And not only, there are a couple or three Alleluias tacked onto the introit, the offertory, and the communion antiphons. And there's a preface that's proper to Easter tide. So there's a special preface for Easter, and that preface is used up to and including uh, Trinity Sunday, uh, not uh, including Pentecost, but not Trinity Sunday. Jim, one of the, the fascinating things about uh, converting to tradition, if you will, is that these liturgical years uh, continue to be lived at home. It's not just uh, a, an experience that's kind of confined to the liturgy that the church and her wisdom and and our ancestors have have created all of these customs and 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 these uh, traditional practices so that we can continue to live that in our daily life we're really immersed in the liturgical year at home so could we talk about some of the the more traditional popular customs and devotions at home during this during this period of easter time Sure, there's some very interesting differences. So um, first one to notice, during the Easter octave in particular, <clears throat> instead of the normal grace before and after meals. So before meals, we would normally say, bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, et cetera. After meals, we would say, we give thee thanks for these and all thy benefits. During the octave, there's a special grace for Easter. And it's very simple. This is the day that the Lord hath made, alleluia. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, alleluia. Then, glory be to the Father, etc. There's also a beautiful custom used during the octave. Rather than simply say hello or good day or even happy Easter, and this is throughout the world, and we've really lost this custom. We're trying really hard to bring this back. 
over at St. Anthony's here in North Carolina. So rather than a hello or a howdy doody, <clears throat> Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. So I say to you, Christ is risen. And I can put an hallelujah on the end of that. And you reply, he, he is, is risen, risen indeed. Hallelujah. And note, not he has risen. And this is important. He is risen. Big difference. And by the way, it's often enough, especially in traditional circles, rather than to say it in the vernacular, Christus resurrexit, alleluia, resurrexit vere, alleluia. Christ is risen, alleluia. He is risen indeed, alleluia. Then, throughout Paschal Tide, another custom, instead of praying the Angelus, which we should be doing at home at noon, at, uh, at 6 a.m., at noon, and 6 p.m., or as close as you can come, we pray the Angelus, but during uh, all of Paschal Tide, so from Easter Sunday through the Saturday before Trinity Sunday, we say instead the Regina Celi which queen of heaven rejoice, hallelujah, for him thou wast made worthy to bear, hallelujah, and etc. Thank you for the, covering those devotions. Great things. I know my children in particular love to learn that kind of stuff. It helps them be, you know, as much Catholic in practice as just, you know, American, right? Because of the cultures that we live in, we're immersed in, you know, it's just kind of American blah. So that's, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Now that, that brings up a good point also, the Marian anthems. Indeed, um, the Regina Chaley is one of those. These are four hymns, anthems, that are sung in the divine office, specifically toward the end of Compline. There are four of them, and they vary according to the liturgical season. And you're going to you're going to see a very clear pattern here. So the first is Ama Redemptoris Mater. Okay, it's sung from the first Sunday of Advent until the Feast of the Purification. Then we have the Ave Regina Celorum, Hail Queen of Heaven, is sung from the purification until the Easter Vigil. Now we're singing the Regina Celi. That's sung from the Easter Vigil through Pentecost Sunday and up to and including the Saturday before Trinity Sunday. And then for the better part of the year, the Salve Regina is sung from the day after Pentecost Sunday until Saturday before the first Sunday of Advent. And you're going to see the very clear relationship within the seasons, within the two cycles, the incarnation cycle and the Paschal cycle. By the way, these are sung necessarily in, at Compline in the Divine Office, but you will often hear them sung at the offertory during Mass and best done according to the season. Does anything change regarding the mysteries of the rosary that should be said? This is a question I've gotten a, quite a bit of. People are, they're aware that we're no longer in that penitential season. This is where we're saying hallelujah and so forth. People are wondering, well, am I supposed to do something different with my daily rosary? So there's a, there's a rhythm with respect to the mysteries, joyful, sorrowful, and glorious. And it's pretty straightforward. Now, it's important to understand the rosary is not the liturgy. It's not part of liturgy, but it's very liturgical in spirit. And so it's influenced by the liturgy. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, joyful, sorrowful, glorious mysteries. Then again, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, joyful, sorrowful, and glorious mysteries. Sunday varies according to the liturgical season. So joyful throughout the incarnation cycle. So from the first Sunday of Advent through the day before Septuagesima Sunday. The sorrowful mysteries then through the first portion of the Paschal cycle from Septuagesima Sunday through Holy Saturday inclusive. Then on Sundays from Easter until the Saturday before the first Sunday of Advent, you see, you're seeing, you're seeing a very clear pattern here, right? Glorious mysteries. This is only with respect to the Sundays during those liturgical seasons. In general, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, joyful, sorrowful, glorious. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, joyful, sorrowful, glorious. Now, we can... Jim, Go ahead. Jim, I, I think you've forgotten something. Tell me. 
the luminous mysteries. <laughs> Don't start on me. <laughs> well, that throws a wrench into the works, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with Our Lady, and she gave us three sets of mysteries, and that is the long-standing tradition in the church. And yeah, there are other ways to pray the rosary, but this is what's customary. This is what's traditional, and that's what I'm sticking with. So you've, uh, I, I'm sure you would agree that it's, it can't be wrong to meditate on the events of our Lord's life, but you, uh, in your, your great explanation here about the, the liturgies and why we say the mysteries, you've demonstrated, demonstrated that, that there's a, there's a, a fantastic ordering to, to what we do and what we've always done. You've also, of course, alluded to the origin, the, the supernatural origin of, of these ordering. From a purely practical standpoint, if, if somebody wanted to introduce a novelty about praying, it would mess up this whole... Totally. totally. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there's no, there's really no way to kind of reconcile it with, with what you've just demonstrated in terms of the no, cycles no. and the days. And, 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 and not only, not only what this has done, it has driven a wedge between those of us who follow tradition and, and those who don't. Uh, I remember when, when it was first put out by John Paul II and I referred to it and I, and I, I will not repent. I referred to it as the Novus Ordo Rosarie, a new order of the rosary. And it has done nothing but drive, drive division. Yeah. Um, my response to that is, if you want to pray the Luminous Mysteries and just tack that on to the other three every day, get them all in every day, I, I'm not going to stop you. But it, if, if like most Catholics, you're saying, you know, the five decades every day, what the Portuguese would call, uh, what is it, a, a Turkish? Terse. Terse, right. Yeah, Turkish, Terse, a, a third, uh, you know, all, third, of, all right. of a sudden, it's, it's, it's chaos. Um, okay, anyway, sorry for that tangent. So, Anything special, going to, getting back to the rosary and what, why we say certain mysteries on certain days and certain times of the years, year, what about during this octave, uh, is there anything special um, for, for people who really are wanting to be close to the church's liturgical heart, anything special for, for this octave of Easter for mysteries of the rosary? So maybe, um, strictly speaking, you follow the general model during the week. You do the glorious on Sunday, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you follow the pattern of joyful, sorrowful, glorious. Some folks prefer to do only the glorious during the octave. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say there's anything particularly wrong with that. It's, it's certainly not prescribed, but then nothing is prescribed. There is simply custom, okay? So some folks will do only the glorious throughout all days of the octave. And others follow the, the conventional pattern of joyful, sorrowful, glorious uh, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then again on uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I'll point out that whatever you're doing, it, it falls under the heading of local custom and local can, can be my house. That's very local. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's proper for, for fathers in particular, but certainly mothers and fathers generally speaking to to create these customs within their families within their their homes to teach those to their children and and for the rest of us to be to be respectful of that right unless there's some sort of positive error right absolutely absolutely all right so uh, you know that uh trads are are very uh, conscious of their duties and uh they're is such a thing as an Easter duty. What is that exactly? So this is a long-standing um, precept, not a, not a custom, but actually a, a precept, an obligation, one of the precepts of the church to receive Holy Communion once a year at Easter time. Now, what is Easter time? That used to mean, the precept was very specific. It's in, in the 1917 Code of Canon Law. That means either Palm Sunday, from Palm Sunday, through low Sunday, which is the Sunday after Easter. That's, that's three Sundays, two weeks. So 15 days. Current canon law says during Paschal Tide, which means from Easter to 
Pentecost and through the Saturday before Trinity Sunday. In the U.S., this is extended. <laughs> We're so special here in the United States. Are we special? And why is it that all our specialness always makes life easier instead of harder? But we are granted from Ash Wednesday until Trinity Sunday inclusive to go to communion once. Now, note that sacrilegious communion does not fulfill the precept, so it makes sense to go to confession. The current catechism of the Council of the Catholic Church says that Catholics are obliged to confess serious sins once a year, serious sins being mortal sins. So uh, once a year, if you have mortal sin, must confess that to be absolved and then receive uh, Holy Communion in a state of grace. All right, Jim, uh, you uh, were absent last week, and in your absence, I had on uh, Louis Tafari, and uh, I thought it was going to be a very boring uh, filler, um, but it turned out to be extremely controversial, uh, and so I should have mentioned this at the beginning of our uh, discussion today. I would like for you to avoid controversy, because during Easter, we focus on happiness and bunnies and food and so forth. But I do have a few questions for you that, that people, <laughs> people have sent in. Okay. I wish, mm -hmm. I wish we could have gotten to this last, uh, last week, but um, let's go ahead and talk about it because it's fresh in our, our minds. Uh, several people have asked, when does the Lenten fast actually end? There's a lot of like, is Lent over on Holy Thursday because the Triduum starts, or is it Friday because of whatever, or is it Saturday? I mean, there's all sorts of confusion. So can you clear that up without controversy? No, I can, I can clear it up, but it's, I, can't, I can't promise that it's not going to irk somebody. The simple answer is the traditional fast, according to the most recent rules, before we changed was midnight on Holy Saturday. Prior to that, it was at noon on Holy Saturday, but it was changed. But I want, I want to be very clear about this. There is no binding obligation under the current code of canon law to either fast or abstain on Holy Saturday. So <laughs> do whatever you like. As, as a friend of mine says, under the new law, anything goes. Right. 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 Um, so let, let's let's be really clear. We're talking about two things. They happen to have the same answer. One is your personal penitential practice that you've done for Lent. Um, and, and you kind of want to know, all right, when am I done? And then the other is the traditional practice, which would have been to fast and abstain uh, on Holy Saturday. Right. The traditional answer to the end of both of those is midnight on Holy midnight. Saturday. Right. right. But if you went somehow to a vigil that ended before midnight, it's actually Easter for you already, right? Like at 11 or something. And it still doesn't matter because there's no binding law. There's, there's no binding law. Yeah. So do what right. you like. <laughs> but we're going to talk about what you like and, and maybe maybe we can all rethink that. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had a lot of questions and I know you did as well. Uh, it's really interesting about the vigil mass. And I, I think, Jim, I think, I know you've grown up in tradition, but for those of us who started in the Novus Ordo, made this transition, they've probably developed a, uh, a skepticism or maybe even a, a distrust of the word vigil because they've heard, hey, lots of people now go to mass at four o'clock on Saturday afternoon. And that way they can you know, they go play golf on Sunday or whatever, not be bothered by our Lord. And fulfill their Sunday obligation by going to Mass on Saturday. Right. right. So they, they, they hear about this Easter vigil and people are saying, hey, you need to go. There's going to be a fire beforehand. There's going to be all sorts of beautiful chants. But, but they actually have some, some fear because of what they've heard about vigils. And they want to know, does that vigil Mass actually satisfy the Sunday obligation? It absolutely unequivocally does and that's it didn't at one point as 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 the 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 church was transitioning toward the new order for 
the, the triduum, there was a period when it was very clear that unless it started so as to begin, so the vigil ceremony started so as to begin the mass roughly at midnight, that if you had it earlier in the day, it would not, not satisfy your Sunday obligation. That is, that has been changed. And so even according to the new code of the vigil mass on Christmas, on Easter rather, satisfies the obligation to hear mass on Sunday, even if it starts well before midnight. Now, to just clarify some terminology, there's mass on the vigil, but a vigil as such is an anticipation services, devotions to prepare for a great feast. These have been essentially obliterated in the church, but the vigil of Easter remains with all of its ceremonies, and it certainly has the most pomp of all of the ceremonies of the church. So the vigil itself should start typically around 10 o'clock, such that the vigil mass, the mass of the Paschal Vigil, starts around midnight, and that certainly fulfills your Sunday obligation. Now, while you were gone, uh, Louis Tafari and I talked about the pre-1955 uh, liturgical rites. These are things which had existed until 1955, and there's been a lot of interest in that. A, a lot of people uh, are saying, well, they, they were more beautiful, or they were more elegant, or, they, or, or whatever whatever their reasons were, they, they enjoy them. And there are some places where um, priests have received permission to utilize those rites. And some of those vigil masses occur at noon on Saturday, uh, which I guess is a very ancient practice, but it does raise, and I, I hate to complicate it, but I, I've already gotten the question, so I, we need to address it. So in spite of everything that you just said, about the Easter vigil on Saturday night, satisfying the Sunday obligation. If somebody went to the pre-1955 Easter vigil and it was held at noon on Saturday, the answer is, well, it, it would not satisfy their obligation because the current code of canon law says it's got to be after 4 p.m., right? Right, right. So, but, but it wouldn't, it would not have when that liturgy was the liturgy that was in force. So if you're gonna, I mean, if you're gonna, you can't play by two sets of rules. So yeah, it's it's tough. Yeah. Um, All right. Yeah. Well, that's that's not the fault of the lady. What we want, of course, is to know. We want to know what's true. We want to know what's right. We want to know what's what we're obligated to. And then, in terms of preferences or additional practices, um, that of course is all voluntary. Um, okay. So got another one. Uh, and I'm afraid we won't be able to escape any sort of controversy with this. Friday. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Trad, here we go. <laughs> yeah. So uh, trads abstain from meat on all Fridays of the year, generally speaking. The exception, even though it's such a mess between what canon law and the, and, and the local bishops conferences do or don't claim it. Anyway, trads do it because they want to. But when there's a holy day of obligation, sometimes that's suspended. People who are kind of living in both worlds, Novus Ordo and tradition, if there's a solemnity on a Friday, they may or may not abstain. Uh, so bottom line, what Friday octave of Easter do trads abstain? <laughs> What binds in the new code of canon law under penalty of sin? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Got to eat meat. If you're following the old rules, that's voluntary. So what binds under penalty of sin? Nothing. Go ahead and eat meat. But why? <laughs> in the old rules, would we be dispensed? The answer is no. But the old rules don't bind. So you don't need a dispensation. Go ahead and eat meat. Now. Do you think you're doing enough penance? Recalling that our Lord very clearly said, unless you do penance, you shall likewise perish. If you're buying that, no, you're not required to abstain. But you abstain because it's the smart thing to do. Uh, so am I 
am I committing a sin if I eat fish and enjoy it? <laughs> no, that's not the point. No, the point of, of uh, the, the point is to not necessarily to mortify the, the passions and passions are not evil. Okay. Let's just be very clear about that. The, the point of fasting or abstaining is not to mortify the, the, the legitimate passion to enjoy good food. The point of it is to mortify the will to do what I'm told instead of what I prefer. And so I, I actually, I love seafood. So for me, it's, it's not, a, it's not a penance of the senses. It's not a mortification of the passions. But you know, I, what is it? But <laughs> just the idea of a steak seems so much better on a Friday. That, that's true. So what if, I, what if I make a great steak and I, then I take pictures and I post it all over social media? Is that a sin? Uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it is a, it's a sin, but it's really a missed opportunity to demonstrate um, some, some mortification. So if you're posting pictures of it, you, you, might, be, you might be causing others to, to miss that opportunity to mortify themselves. So, but, a, but a flat out sin, no. Not unless it's your intent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think there's a great point to be made here that, that a lot of Catholics probably don't understand that that if we make this admittedly minor sacrifice on Friday to, to eat fish, you and I like fish, uh, not everybody does, but of course we have many options in the first world. So oh, come on, there's a grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, which if, if done well, right, you make your own, home, own uh, homemade tomato soup. I mean, that, that can be quite a meal. But anyway, uh, it, it's not impossible to sacrifice and be joyful. Right. And, and, and I think that I think that a lot of people don't quite get that, that we can still be full of joy and, and saying Alleluia to one another. And we can be thinking every day about this, this extraordinary uh, grace of the resurrection and our redemption and so forth. And, and still make a minor sacrifice without somehow like blowing it up. I mean, I, I promise you on Friday, we're going to see on social media people saying, if you're not feasting on meat, you're sinning because you're somehow schismatic with the spirit of the church. Yeah. I think as trads, it's a great opportunity to say, no, we, we can make that tiny little sacrifice and still be joyful. And we're, it's, it's the way Catholics have always lived, right? Sure, sure. All right, um, enough about all that. Uh, one more thing. We have rogation days coming up. I think there's even one called a super rogation day or something. What's right, so there's there there's the major rogation day and then the minor rogation days. By the way, that, it's a weird term rogation. It comes from Latin rogare. You will recognize it from the litany of the saints. Te rogamus audi knows. After you make some petition to our Lord, it's um, we beseech thee, Lord. So rogation is a day in which we beseech the Lord God. The, the major rogation day is April 25th. Now, this is simultaneous with the Feast of St. Mark, but it's not in any way liturgically connected to the Feast of St. Mark. It just happens to be that the day of the major rogation is April 25th, and the Feast of St. Mark is April 25th, but they're not, they're not liturgically connected. They coincide, that's all. Then we have the minor rogation days on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday before the Thursday of the Ascension. These were formerly days of fast and partial abstinence, and I wasn't able to dig out exactly when this changed, but it's been at least 100 years because uh, it refers to them formerly as days of fast of abstinence in the Catholic Encyclopedia, which was published in the first, uh, around 1915 or so. So what are they about? They are about appeasing God's anger and to atone for sin. So there are definitely a mea culpa day, there are, there are a strike your breast day. Fasting and abstinence no longer bind. So if you think you're doing enough penance, don't fast or abstain. On the other hand, unless you do penance, you shall likewise perish. 
Thank you, Jim. Great, as, as always, a, a fantastic uh, episode. I appreciate all that you have invested to, uh, to make these uh, so valuable to us. Uh, folks, if you have uh, been enjoying this uh, episode in this series, please uh, subscribe to the channel. Uh, click on that little uh, bell button so you'll get notifications when we publish new ones. Uh, like these episodes if you really do like it, and make sure that you share them with your friends because we continue, Jim and I both, just in the normal course of our, our weeks, we run into people who ask these questions that we're covering. That, that's why we're doing this. So please share it with your friends and continue to ask questions, whether it's uh, in the YouTube comments or in uh, social media. We, we love to see those questions. And obviously we're using those for these episodes. Jim, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jeff, and God bless you. All right, folks, we'll see you uh, next week uh, for the next episode. We've got a lot of great things coming for you. I think you'll be very happy. God bless you.